Hello, welcome once again to Off the Shelf Books on Tour. I'm your host, Veronica Andrews. It's my pleasure to have a scientist here with us today, but it's also scary because I am not. The book is The Scientific Attitude. It came across to me that you wrote this for the likes of me because you don't, you're afraid I'm going to believe the fake news. You're afraid I'm going to depend exclusively on what I hear or what I see. And I read seven newspapers. I watch five different newscasts, and I have the radio on 24-7. But I'm one among many. Thank you for trying so hard to not to alert people to look more, listen longer, and think. Did I get it right? You, you did. Thank, thank you very much. I, I do have to say uh, thank you for the invitation to come. Uh, I'm a philosopher of science, so I'm not actually a, a scientist. Neither but, am I. But I'm, okay. <laughs> but I'm a philosopher who studies uh, science and uh, how scientists explain and what's So that has to be a science, science in itself. In a way, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. That's, of course, a philosophical question right there. No, 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 don't, no, 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 no. Um, why? Did you want to grow up to be a physiological scientist who wrote books to warn me not to fall into crevices? <laughs> I started college wanting to be an astronomer, and I was always interested in physics and astronomy and uh, studied that. And then I took a course in economics where the professor uh, had us read a book in the philosophy of science by Thomas Kuhn and used that to argue for why economics wasn't and could never be a science. And I thought, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> and that got me interested in philosophy and philosophy of science. Uh, I'm a scholar in that area and I wrote some books and some articles for my colleagues in philosophy. But then at a certain point, I realized that science was under attack and I wanted to write a book that was for the general public, that it, was, it didn't change the arguments that philosophers were making, but it was something that anybody could read and enjoy that would help them to learn what's special about science and how to use that to fight back against all of the climate change deniers and the anti-vaxxers and the flat earthers and the other people who don't believe in science. Are you for climate change? Do you believe in it? I do. Me too. And do you feel bad for the people who don't? Uh, feel bad, uh, I, I guess, I in a way. They, they cause an awful lot of trouble, so I, I don't <laughs> it's hard to, to feel uh, too badly. Well, they're going to have a rude awakening someday. They, they are, but they're, but they're taking the rest of us with them. Uh, that's the, the yeah, trouble. If you look at the representation in, in Congress, uh, some science deniers um, aren't really hurting anyone, but other science deniers are, and so I have really devoted my time in the last several years to trying to figure out a strategy for uh, pushing back against them, uh, both to convince them that they're wrong, you know, to present evidence and to attack their reasoning strategy to, to show them why they're wrong, but also, as you said in your intro, to keep other people from believing it. Because I think that some of the disinformation about science is a type of fake news. It is a type of um, you know, not cleaving to the standard that scientists use, and so people believe things that aren't true because they're they're not reasoning about it in the because right way. Because somebody said it out loud, That's they right. read it in print, or they picked it up at the coffee shop. I, I think that's right. I mean, if people want to believe that something's true, they can now go on the internet and find somebody who agrees with them. They can find some channel on YouTube or, or some news site that reinforces what they want to believe which is not what scientists do. Uh, scientists have a hypothesis that they test against the evidence, and if the evidence says their hypothesis is wrong, they give it up. That's not what science deniers do. Science deniers tend to already know what they want to believe, and then they shop for facts to back it up, which right, is the wrong way. Right, and they want you to believe what they believe, but how hard, it, how hard is it to be you because you believe as yeah. strongly in what you've proven yeah. as against what they've proven. Do you have, 
clashes? I, I do, um, and, and I have clashes because I pursue this. I don't just, the part, writing this book uh, led me to start thinking about the fact that I didn't just want to sit in my study, write my book and be right, and have other people read it and tell me I was right. I wanted to get out and do something. And so I'm now uh, on book tour and taking that opportunity to uh, speak, and also taking the opportunity to speak to uh, communities of science deniers. So I'll actually go on trips. Um, I just got back from a trip to uh, coal country up in Pennsylvania to talk with coal miners about climate change. Big surprise, the ones that I spoke to believed in climate change. So, you know, this assumption that, well, maybe because their salary depends on coal, they're, you know, they're going to think that coal doesn't cause greenhouse gas, which doesn't cause climate change. No, they understood, uh, they understood it. But, but I'm, the point is that I'm out there trying to uh, engage with people about their beliefs about scientific topics and, uh, you know, have, have had, that, that turned out to be a very good experience talking to the coal miners. Th there have been some others that have been more confrontational. But I find, I'm not a scholar, my life has taught me things that I didn't need explained. I've grown up in New England, we visited in Pennsylvania, and we saw a lot of vacant houses. I mean, this is beautiful country. Mm -hmm. So we asked why. If I'd never gone to Pennsylvania, I would not have known about the coal mines mm -hmm. underneath the ground that yeah. catch fire and burn for years. Mm -hmm. And, oh, so sad, you just pick everything up you own and move to, you don't own the land, you only own the house that sits on it. Mm -hmm. My son came in the other night and said, Mommy, big fire in Pennsylvania, smoke coming out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, yeah, well, you know, there are coal mines under there that catch fire and you mm -hmm. can't put them out. But wow. people don't, I retain those experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'd have collected if I read it in a book. I, I'm glad you told me. I, I, in fact, didn't know about that. You didn't? I did, didn't know about the, the coal fire. Oh, I no. was horrified. I mean, can yeah. you imagine going to bed no. every night wondering if there was a fire under your that's house? Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And when you think about it, how would you put it out? It's coal. Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot of danger to coal. The, the coal miners that I spoke to talked about the, uh, the threat to their health, uh, not just the, the threat to the environment, and they were uh, they were good people. They were sort of fatalistic. They did what they did because they had to feed their families, and you know understood the risks every day when they. When and they went down some to the mine. areas, it's the only option. Yeah, no, that that's right. And so that I mean, that's part of the reality of fighting back against uh, science denial. N nobody identifies as a science denier. They they identify usually as a as a skeptic or or even as a scientist, and they but they. They think that the mainstream science is pulling the wool over somebody's eyes, or that they haven't, you know, uh, you know, come to the end of the argument yet. An agenda. But, it, but if you or have an agenda, but if you scratch it uh, hard enough, you usually find that there's some sort of interest behind it. Not always an economic interest, but something that is motivating them to believe what they believe and to reject the science. Uh, and they tend not to reject all science; they're just what I call cafeteria skeptics, <laughs> they'll pick the thing that they don't like, uh, and then that's what they push back But on. as busy as you are trying so hard to make us think, mm -hmm. gather information, prove, who's got the time? The um, average American would rather watch General Hospital, right. a NASCAR race, mm -hmm. or who's playing football. I mean, right. I'm football stupid. I don't even <laughs> bother putting TV on over the weekend. Well, I, I'm not going to get myself in trouble talking about that, but <laughs> I do, I do want to say that um, it, it seems to me that uh, you, when you say people don't have the time, they, they don't, which means that they're relying on the media. And up until a few years ago, the media was doing a very poor job of science coverage. You look at some of the um, split screen debate, debates they'd have on TV over uh, vaccines. Um, there was, we all know about the Andrew Wakefield study, the, the discredited study, the debunked study, 
which purported to show that there was a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. Well, that, that so that, that study was, was shown to be fraudulent. Yeah, and that um, didn't help the cause. That, that's right. But the way that the media portrayed it uh, uh, years ago was as if there were a debate but there wasn't a scientific debate over it. They're, so what they were really presenting was misinformation. They were misinforming the public. Well, if you say it out loud enough and that's all the that's people right. listen to, maybe they'll that's believe right. it. And up until recently, they were still doing that. But and then the, the uh, measles outbreak in 14 states, and then all of a sudden they stopped doing that. Recently, they've stopped doing. Some media outlets are no longer doing that for climate change either. They, it's like they got the memo all of a sudden and realized this is actually a crisis, and let's stop just worrying about getting raiders for a contra controversy. This, this is we're actually doing a disservice, and so you're seeing better coverage now, but still uh, not always done in the right way because I think that because I think they don't really understand science. They, they don't have time? They, well, <laughs> the, the, the media does have time. The media does have time. I love investigative reporting. When was the last time you saw one? They yeah. didn't have Trump in the first sentence yeah. and Biden in the second yeah. sentence and Clinton in the third. I, yeah. you know. It's the, the, latest, mm. the latest scandal. Mm. Or, the late, or when they do cover science, they cover the latest scientific finding. But they almost never talk about the process by which scientists reached it or, or what they, they talk about the threat but they don't talk about the analysis they don't talk about the rigor or the consensus are the, the everyday people who worked at I look at the 12 sarcophaguses that they found mm -hmm. last week by accident yeah and the one thing that's bothered me in this news cycle is did you see an awful lot of coverage about the two women astronauts that walked in space just a little bit just a little bit yeah yeah. I'm sorry, but if that had been two guys, yeah, I've seen them bouncing around yeah. the outside with yeah. that good many a time. No, it was historic, and yeah. they really didn't do enough on no, it. No, they didn't, and that's a disservice to young women. It is to middle-aged women and to old women. Yeah, I'm. I was. I saw Sally Ride go first, mm -hmm. and now here's another entire generation of yeah. girls in science, which you never have enough of. That's right. Um, doing a really big accomplishment. That's, that's true. So not only do I feel that the populace didn't get enough coverage, mm -hmm. the coverage that they chose was so minimal. Mm -hmm. I've had people say, they what? They didn't even know they did yeah, it. Yeah, they didn't know they did it. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's right. But how many congressional hearings have we seen all week? <laughs> Bonk. I said to send them to yeah. space. Now, this isn't your only book. You've written another one since and another one before, and there's a novel in there. Aren't you a busy... <laughs> what do you do, write them on the airplanes? Uh, no, I don't write on the airplanes, but I, I love my work. Um, so th this is my most recent nonfiction book. I did have an earlier book uh, just a year before with the same publisher, MIT Press, and that book was called Post Truth, which um, is kind of an interesting relationship to this book. Because uh, po I think of post-truth as a um, the political subordination of reality, where somebody is pretending that something is true for political purposes. Think about when Trump had the uh, uh, NOAA map of the path of Hurricane Dorian, and he took out the sharpie and drew on it to, to you know to, so that he wouldn't be wrong about the path of the hurricane. That's an example of post-truth. Because I thought it was stupidity. Well, <laughs> may, <laughs> maybe that, but or, or people said it was lying, but it's not lying because when you lie to somebody, you're actually trying to convince them that what you're saying is true, and I don't think that he cared about that. I mm -hmm. think that that was an example of him trying to dominate our reality to say, I've got so much power that I can tell you that this is true. And if I say it loud enough, long right. enough, and often enough, that's right. You'll believe it. That's right, and I think. And I think there's a relationship between that, post-truth, and this, science denial. Because I think that if you look back in history, you see that what happened in the um, 1950s um, is that the cigarette companies were fighting the idea that there was a link between smoking and lung cancer. They, uh, they did a public relations campaign over this uh, in order to fight the science. And were very successful in that. 
And then that became the blueprint for climate change denial, acid rain denial, the ozone hole, et cetera. But the headline was polio, polio, polio. Okay. You found those stories on page yep. 724 of yep. the back page. That's right. And so what I think is that all of those 60 or 70 years of science denial led the politicians uh, to think around about uh, uh, the, the turn of this century or a little bit later, you know, if we can deny the facts about climate change, we can deny the facts about anything. We can deny the facts about how many people were at an inauguration. We can deny whether the murder rate is falling because we need it to be rising in order to justify building more prisons. We can deny the path of a hurricane. It's, it's all this cynical attempt to show how much power they have. And what they want us to And what to they believe. want to be true. And it's not unrelated to science denial because I think that you know if you look at people who are pretending climate change isn't real, what they're really saying is that they don't want it to be real. Maybe because they don't want to spend the money to mitigate it or they're making money on fossil fuels or they want to, uh, it suits their ideology somehow. And it's just sort of this pushback against reality based on what they want to be true. And, and I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's a problem. So I've been writing about that, a couple of books now, very serious topics. Yeah, but there's no sex, there's no bad words, nobody gets killed. So that's my novel. <laughs> very good. So I was writing these very serious books and reading the news, and I, I don't not quite have uh, the news on 24-7 like you do, but, but it's overwhelming. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, and it's easy to be upset all the time. And so I needed an escape. I needed something that was uh, fun and something that was a little more emotional rather than rational. Outside and your I, books. And I, and I wanted to write, and I wanted to challenge myself because writing fiction is very hard. And I'd been trying it for, for quite some time. And so uh, recently I just had my first novel uh, published, uh, which I'm very excited about. Now what's his name? It's called The Sin Eater. Ah. And so that's um, really challenged me as a writer to do something else. It also, I was writing it at the time that I was doing Scientific Attitude. Learning to write fiction helped me with nonfiction because I learned how to tell a story. I learned sometimes that people are convinced by a story more than an argument and that I needed to not just be a philosopher all the time and make the arguments, but to illustrate the arguments, you know, do the, the actual uh, uh, examples that are more likely to convince people. Everybody doesn't get a brain that processes. It's, they get a brain, sit on the couch and believe everything you're told. Or, I love this position because I would not pick your book up in a bookstore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it came, yeah. Because I had to read it, and I have a mind quarter of as good as yours. <laughs> well, I learned something new from every book I read, and seven out of ten are not books that I would choose to mm -hmm. read. Yeah. But I'm grateful for every one that I have. That's great. That's great. But other people will read only romance novels. Mm -hmm. Well, only scientific, written by philosophers, yeah. philosophy. You know, and I'm grateful that my parents always gave me the alternative. That, that, is, that is important. It's, it's important, important for kids to have books in the house. Oh, yeah. I, you know, the most important book for me was the World Book Encyclopedia because, you know, that was back when it was the encyclopedia. There was no internet. There was no home computer. And I just felt like everything was in there. Everything in the entire world that people knew. Well, at was the in time, there. they believed that yeah. it was, and and that that was th that was inspiring to me. And so I remember reading, just picking up. Uh, a re I had a little heater spot in the house where I'd sit, and the warm air would blow, and I just grab a, a volume of the encyclopedia and just sit there and read it. And it was it was fun. And today's kids' memory is going to be <laughs> iPad one or eleven. Now we're going to stop yeah. for a minute, let him catch his breath, and he's going to read for you so you get an idea of his style because you've now had an idea of his personality and his ability. See you in a minute.
So I'm going to read a little bit from the opening of my book. This is from the introduction on the first page to mm -hmm. sort of frame the context. We live in extraordinary times for the understanding of science. In May 2010, the prestigious journal Science published a letter signed by 255 members of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. It began, quote, we are deeply disturbed by the recent escalation of political assaults on scientists in general and on climate scientists in particular. All citizens should understand some basic scientific facts. There's always un some uncertainty associated with scientific conclusions. Science never absolutely proves anything." End quote. But how many lay people understand what this means and recognize it as a strength rather than a weakness of scientific reasoning? And of course, there are always those who are willing to exploit any uncertainty for their own political purposes. The attack on science has now gotten so bad that on April 22, 2017, there was a march for science in 600 cities around the world. At the one in Boston, Massachusetts, I saw signs that said, keep calm and think critically. Extremely mad scientist. No science, no Twitter. I love reality. And my favorite, it's so severe, the nerds are here. It takes a lot to get scientists out of their labs and onto the streets, but what else were they supposed to do? The issue of what's special about science is no longer purely academic. If we cannot do a better job of defending science, of saying how it works and why its findings have a privileged claim to believability, we'll be at the mercy of those who would thoughtlessly reject it. Says it like it is. Thank you. I appreciate your efforts on my behalf because <laughs> I'm never going to understand it all. But I, I can remember when Teflon came in, yeah, and that was a scientific discovery because of the space shuttle. Basic research, space. basic research has led to so many scientific break, break, breakthroughs: nylon, radar, silicone, the microchip. Just all these things that we use now in everyday life were, were a, a result of basic research. It's we quite incredible. We were at uh, Epcot maybe 30 years ago, and they said the day will come when we will walk around with a computer in our hand mm -hmm. that will run our homes, mm -hmm. turn on our lights, start our car. And I went, yeah, right. It's like on the beach. I mean, everything that they yeah, said is true. And they're going to rebuild Epcot now because scientifically they've learned how to do it better. I wonder what they're going to predict next. We better look out. I, sometimes I don't want to know. Well, it yeah. would be nice if it was good news. That, that, would, that would be yes. good. Yes. Thank you for good. coming. I'm anxious to have you back for Post-Truth. Thank you. This is the next book, but that's not the novel. No, that, that post-truth is actually the book uh, from, before the, um, uh, from before the scientific attitude. Uh, the novel is, uh, is called The Sin Eater, and this is uh, just out with uh, Brave Ship Books. Not scientific at all. Uh, no. Uh, the, these books build brain cells. That one will kill them. <laughs> okay, and I also see a Newsweek photo yes. there. Yeah, so th this is related to the, um, to the question about me going on the road to talk with science deniers. So those are the people who don't, who, no, those are the people who believe very strongly. That the Earth is flat. Yeah. So in November 20, uh, 2018, I went to the Flat Earth International Conference in Denver, Colorado. I bought the ticket, uh, went incognito, uh, you know, had the badge, wore the flannel shirt, looked like everybody else. <laughs> For the first day, I didn't say a word. I just, I kept my mouth shut. But the second day, um, I told them that I was a philosopher of science and that I didn't believe that the earth was flat. And I wanted to talk to them about their reasoning. I didn't present any evidence because I'm not a scientist and face it, the evidence has been around for 2,300 years. They didn't believe it from there. They're not going to believe it from me. What I wanted to do as a philosopher is to talk about inconsistencies in their reasoning strategy. And I asked him a very sharp philosophical question, which I, I talk in the, the article a little bit about how that went over. This question is from a philosopher about 100 years ago named Karl Popper. Uh, and he said, um, tell me what evidence it would take to convince you that you were wrong. So they were claiming that their view was based on evidence. And so my question was, 
all right, so they don't think that we went to the moon. They reject all the pictures from NASA. They reject you know, all the evidence we can offer. So tell me, what evidence, if I could produce it, would be sufficient to make you change your mind? Because if they can't answer that question, then they, they're not really believing it as a scientific theory, and they could not answer that question. And uh, of course, n nobody tore off their badge and ran out in the parking <laughs> lot with me, but I felt that I did make some progress in at least making them think about uh, what was inconsistent about their reasoning. And we drew a little bit of a crowd, and so I was hoping that there was a little bit of an audience for that too, because I'm not just fighting back against the people who already have the hardcore beliefs like the flat earthers, but their audience too. Because believe it or not, they take this seriously, they actually believe the earth is flat and there's a dome over the top, um, and they're recruiting new members. Uh, yeah, they, they have YouTube videos, they go to college campuses, and people begin to believe this they, because they don't know how to reason. They're ardent in their belief, and they really truly believe it. They absolutely mm -hmm. do. It's not, it's not a uh, just for a joke, they, they actually genuinely believe it, which is why I took it seriously. And I also took it seriously because I feel that s all science deniers are sort of the same in their reasoning strategy, and I wanted to practice on the flat earthers so that I knew what to say to the climate change deniers later, and that's my, uh, my next book. So you learned something in doing what you believed in. That, that's right, it, it, and it was, it was odd because there were 600 people there who thought the earth was flat, and I was, I think, the only one other than some of the camera crews from the news who didn't agree with them. But it, it was, so it was odd to be in a room where you were outnumbered like that, but I, I really learned something about how to approach it. Most important was you don't convince anyone by calling them stupid, by uh, uh, demoralizing them, or, or just you, you have to treat them with but respect. Make fun of their beliefs. You have to treat them with respect, listen, take their arguments seriously, and then hope that they take you seriously as well. That's what builds trust. That's how people actually change their minds. It's called respect. Respect. And, and so I was very calm. That's a scientific anomaly. <laughs> I was very calm and very respectful, even though I didn't agree with their views, because I, I actually wanted to make some progress. And so I'm, I'm pursuing this now in my next book, which is called How to Talk to a Science Denier. I'm working on it right now, writing about these encounters that I've had with science deniers to try to get them to change their minds. Cool. Well, you're going to come back. Thank you. And ch we'll read the novel by then. Okay. And see if you do as well in the novel as <laughs> you've done now. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. And for educating me further should I meet up with the denialist. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. That's it for Off the Shelf Books on Tour. This book is The Scientific Attitude. Bye now. <laughs>